keep being inquisitive about the things you don't know. We could talk about the amount of research that is actually out there on women specific. We should be asking ourselves questions of what can we be doing to coach to the strengths, mm. not just coach because that's how rowing's supposed to be done. Mm. Hey, what's up? Welcome to Last Stroke Counts. In today's episode, we're very pleased to host the CUBC Chief Women's Coach, Paddy Ryan. Paddy, please welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Um, yes, thank you for having me. It's actually my first podcast. Ah, I've interviewed it? plenty of times, but yeah, first podcast. Awesome. awesome. Hopefully it's a little more casual chat that we like to do rather than rather than interview style. But um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how we go. I think exciting from our point of view, we talked about having some coaches on. We've uh, had a string of uh, high-level rowers, which has been really interesting to get into their stories. Um, but um, the other thing we want to explore is like around the outside and everything else that makes rowing work. So obviously coming to someone who's uh, doing pretty pretty well at the moment. Absolutely. Uh, I caught I caught Paddy at uh, Henley Qualifiers and then I just said that I'm really interested to hear about the dynasty that you've built here at Cambridge. And I think it's fair to say that, that you have, having seen how many, win, uh, what the win streak for Cambridge is at the minute. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's uh, it's very flattering you put it on my shoulders, but I've been privileged to work with some pretty cool people along the way. Um, so... Um, I actually can't track the lightweights rate wins, but there's been more than definitely a lot more wins than losses. But um, the we won our first. I, when I started in 2013, we hadn't won for a couple of years, um, and I'm definitely at no point putting this on my on my shoulders. Uh, and we were, but it's it's like anything. I think. Um, Learning to win is a is a skill. It's um, not necessarily a measurable skill, but there are definitely well, some sports psychologists might disagree with me. But there are some definitely foundations, and um, and Rob taught me a lot of those things. You know, he'd been here in the early O's under Robin and learnt with some incredible coaches accrued through that time. Tim McLaren, Donald Leggett, um, and so he was trying to pass those on. And but you know, we were all trying to figure out. The new role moving to the tideway so there's a lots of stuff going on there so you know we've had some incredible wins and we've had some big losses too but um you know the blondie kind of showed the way a little bit and then you know that was imogen's first year of racing with the club she'd um so she stroked the blondie crew which i uh i had coached with nick acock that year um because it's only happened once, but we did a half, a 50-50 split. So it was half lightweights, half open weights. Um, so the lightweight, those four lightweights, uh, of which Imogen stroke that boat too, had just, and only just lost the um, uh, the lightweight boat race, um, which had been in Henley. Yeah. I think it was, um, you know, they'd been up and just got the road through. So we, we, we processed all of that and then put a crew together and, uh, well, they had been sort of training one week in one boat, one week in the other, and it was it was an interesting um, to try and uh, manage all that. But um, you know, it was also the same year that the blue boat sunk uh, or submerged. It's probably a better description. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because it ra ra um, you know when they got out of the wash and stuff, it rose again, and they finished the race. Mm. And you know, I still remember it's like um, it's like. We're on the front page of most newspapers in the world. Yeah. How weird's that? Uh, this is rowing, um, and then that, it sort of starts to sink into you just how big. I mean, the boat race is big, but actually, from a international perspective, um, it's it's you have to pinch yourself. It's like you just can't quite really relate to how big the race is. Yeah. Um, you know, normal people. I was imbued just after this year's boat race, and they said. Oh, well done, my friend's Oxford. I'm like, oh yes, yeah, so I'm wearing a. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is clear. every year. It's like <laughs> that's so much of it. Yeah, yeah. Um. So yeah. So that you know. So working for Rob definitely taught me things. You know. Um, uh, you know, 
encouraging athletes from other programs and internationals to come over. That's that's a skill I had to learn. Um or a skill we all had to learn. It's a team effort, that one. Um and also refining is you know, what was our style. Um and we have you know, the other thing is that um I was talking to Josh Butler recently and he put it as like I have my gurus and I love that word because actually we're not experts. You know, we are good at what we do, but it's actually by creating a team of people and bringing in expertise that helps either that light bulb moment for that athlete or the um, or or for the coach to actually go, actually, yes, I've, I, I've detoured because I spend all my time staring at well, a large group down to a finer group to others think that actually having a, a different perspective is a huge thing. And those are not things that... I had the opportunity, well, I didn't have quite the clarity of opportunity, say when my time at Thames or working at London's throwing, you're kind of expected to be the expert and deliver and not that team perspective, I think, is is uh, wholesome. Um, so this is something that's more emphasised at Cambridge compared to other clubs, definitely. I definitely think that... that um, it's something that it was shown me, and I've tried to evolve that even more um, in my time in charge. But uh, you know, um, so we won the Blondie race in 2016, uh, 2017. Uh, we didn't clean sweep, so I, I can't. I don't. Maybe we didn't win the lightweights race that year. I can't remember. No, anyway, we definitely won the openweights race because um, quite a long way. Um, I think that was the year that Blue Bay put 36 seconds on uh, Oxford and Blondie put 39 seconds on wow. Oxford. And it was, I mean, uh, yeah, and, and you know, you've got to measure all these things. And it's like we had good crews, you know, that 2017 crew with no opposition set the fastest, then fastest time for, and it was a miles faster than anyone else. You know, Matthew Holland, Melissa Wilson, Holly Hill, uh, Miriam. It's quite an imp- it's a great list of people who then went on to uh, Imogen was in that crew yeah. too, you know, um, uh, Claire Lamb. I mean, you know, uh, feel bad not mentioning everyone else, but the so, you know that crew was fast, but we were also faced at the time when Oxford had uh, their own internal uh, things, and you know, disappointingly for for the race. Um, and I, you know, how it goes out to the athletes had to experience that, but they had almost they almost capsized on the start line. Wow! You know, it's like their riggers went under the water and stuff. I think, and actually, uh, Osiris did almost the same thing. And so, I think that year, you know, we talked about thirty nine seconds. Like, we had a length lead before the end of the uh, before the line of boats. You know, it's like that's not really that that's it's great. It took the edge off. It really transformed the club into. Like this is who we are, and gave us belief and all those sorts of things, and you know, confirmed training hard and all those goals. But when was the last? Uh, don't think we had a close race then for years, uh, yeah, for many years, and that's that's not good for. Um, it's great for us as uh, for us, but it's not necessarily great for the sport. We looked back um, over it, didn't we? we? Had someone ask a question. Um, Obviously, after it was well, our first, first or second episode we did, and sort of, you know, does Oxford get rid of their coach now? Do they change everything? <clears throat> what happens? So we sort of look back through the results, and yeah, there's been quite a few that have been a bit wide. And if you look percentage wise, like two or three lengths on the finish line isn't over an 80 minute race. Like, like we sort of, the thing we said, like, I'd love to see those crews race 2K side by side because, wow, yeah. wow, wouldn't that probably be a close one? Um, yeah, I mean, certainly the 222 crew would have been just, I yeah. mean, uh, humdingers. Yeah. yeah. It was like, we had a slightly slower, um, you know, those first 10, a little bit slower. Then we just sort of piled on the speed and yeah. and stuff, um, you know, and I think that race in itself, I have been nervous every single race. I was not nervous. Um, I was proud that day. Um, and uh, I... I think anyone is um, who can say, yes, I, I, I created that crew is talking out of something um you know grace was an incredible asset um imogen was an incredible asset ruby was an incredible asset but every single person in that crew you know the um, the four returners that was a third boat race um of a, which one had been cancelled 
but they you know they got two weeks before the race so yeah, they earned that yeah. spot they knew what it took mm-hmm. uh then they've done the ely race so the only the thing they were nervous about is doing i think they were probably more nervous about racing with grace and imogen than they were about oxford <laughs> um and they didn't want to let themselves down and all the those pressures that young people put on themselves but you know uh, the proudest thing i'm thinking is like we got there we got made it fast i didn't fuck it up um and I remember I was uh, sitting in the launch with Liv Coffey, um, in a uh, US Olympian 2018 uh, race. And uh, I was like, I, you know, that's pretty quick. And she, she just turned to me and said, that is beautiful. Um, and I'll take my credit. You know, I, 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 I didn't fuck it up. Um, but we had a good program. We created the environment where we could turn things around and we gave them the resources to, to be able to row together, mm. um, which was, you know, but, you know, the people in the boat, they all made it work. Yeah, yeah. you can't do it as a as a coach. You can't, you don't have the all. Um, so like you said, yeah, it's about putting those things in place. And we talk about like throughout the year, having all those pe- people, you know, we used to talk about an innate, there's no... Um, there's no room for dead weight anymore. You know, the three seat is is not your most useless rower. You know, the six seat isn't just the one that's got the big ergo and nothing else. Like, there's no room for that anymore. And again, like what you said, like <clears throat> looking back, like that's why I sort of interested myself in doing long format stuff. It's like great to talk about that year and, and what went into it and what worked from that. But then also, you know, 11 years at Cambridge and all these other things that go into it and all this stuff, you know, because it's awesome to be able to stand up and be like, wow, clean sweep, that's awesome. Um, but I think sometimes it gets devalued a little bit in terms of people, you know, like for example, comes to you, oh, you've done an amazing job, like, well, I've done the last couple of years. And like, it wasn't the last couple of years. You know, I spent 15, no. 20, 30 years of my life building up to this point. Yeah. Like you said, learning from gurus. I love that expression as well, because um, I think in any sport, you can't just, you can't mimic something. You can't, you could take Jürgen's program and what Jürgen does and you can watch him and you could go away to another club and try and be Jürgen and it wouldn't work. Because it, it needs to come from you and the, all those other things that you do. Yeah, and I think we're like I think that's a great analogy because I think there's, um, I mean, very few people make something original anymore. Mm. So what we do is we take the bits and pieces we learn and we try and put it together. And I like to think that I'm continually learning and trying to sort of unpick and evaluate. And I think that's you know part of my role is to to really think about like things and it's like. But also not to compare an Olymp- a year when you've got Olympians to a year when you've got more undergrads. Mm. Like trying to just 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 undergrads trying to row that program. You're like, yeah, I'm going to break them. Mm. Um, so I've got to be thinking and flexible and trying to do that sort of stuff. But but we're pretty. That's probably the thing that I find difficult in our sport is that we're also there are lots of people, lots of coaches who hear something have no context for that that saying or what they're trying to do um and just try and repeat it my, my personal hatred is people saying sit up i'm like why no <laughs> no be tall be powerful but you do it the wrong way you're literally you know creating an incredible bad foundation for this rower's whole future yeah and probably a back injury um so you know it's that though i think we could be a little bit more reflective on um you know, I think the I uh, never finished it, but the British rowing level four was was I did start it, and the reflective element was probably the most powerful. Is like just write stuff down, reflect on it. It's like, well, why am I saying what I'm saying? Does anyone actually understand what I'm saying? Um, yeah. yeah, it's one thing I realised, especially in, we coached at Oxford College for a while, like with Oxford students, obviously athletes who are a little bit brighter or switched on, and you know, uh, the one thing we were taught as an exercise, you know. Um, put the blade in on the way forward and someone would put their hand up and be like, I, I'm, but I can't, can I? I can't actually. And then you'd have to be like, yeah, no, like, like it's sort of, we say that to try and get you to lift your hand earlier so that by the time it does. And then you realize that, oh, actually, you know, like some of these things that I've got taught, maybe I've never even really sort of processed it. Oh, yeah, I'll put it on the way forward. And you never really thought about it. Yeah. Um, and I think I learned when we spoke about this, um, you can you can force an athlete into position. You can sit in the launch and just on the microphone, do this, do this, do this, and, and it'll be perfect in front of you. But you haven't told them why, you haven't made them understand that movement, and you're gonna you're not gonna be there in the race. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. You need to make yourself obsolete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually and the 
uh, the, the, I think that's realizing that and you know you don't tend to be able to do that as a young coach it's, it's, it takes confidence mm. to get to the point to do that um, but if you're feeling like you have to give instructions on the last day actually you're doing more you're, you're doing less to improve their confidence than you, you're, pro you're doing it for your own confidence mm. not for theirs yeah. and I think that's uh, that confidence piece is uh, pretty massive. I, I'm sure. I mean, I've worked, so I'm going to refer to uh, coaching women because I've done that for the last 11 years. I haven't coached a men's crew in a long time. Um, but I think we we um, so uh, I get, I'm going to apologise to Kate Hayes if she ever listens to this. Um, so Kate Hayes is. Um, incredible um sports psychologist um she we had it for a brief period she was also at that time she was i believe um head of a group of sports psychologists in and in, in sport england and stuff and she's now the sports psychologist for the lionesses she's done awesome um uh <laughs> i want to say daily times that's wrong he's a bit uh in tom daly tom daly the the diver and something anyway, so she's think but so one of the first things she sat down with me, Nick, and Rob, um, when she, when Rob um, asked her to come in and sort of help sort of change some of the cultural stuff uh, in terms of how we perceive their training and what outcomes and stuff. She's so like, this is to meet with just the coaching team? This was before she even met the athletes. Yeah, it was yeah. just like it, to explain some of her theories and stuff anyway. So her PhD was um, she, she, she looked at all um, – Essentially, you had to be a world champion or an Olympic. You had to have been a medalist. And they're the only people she spoke to across multiple different sports. And from her data collection and stuff, she realized that actually uh, men can basically win something. And for pretty much the rest of their careers, there is always going to be as good as that. Women don't think like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, they need... Um, and I'm sure there's a whole bunch of reasons why, and it's societal and all those other things I'm not going to unpick, but oh, I don't have the skills to unpick. But the so essentially, they need constant evidence, and you know, just because they did something good, they can they can convince themselves that they're not that good anymore. Mm. So you need to be thinking about um, uh, collecting the evidence and using that those resources to. Um, to keep help you move forward in this sport, and um, and that was for me massive. There's like, oh, right, okay. So, um, and I, you know, I haven't worked with her since 2017. Maybe she did a bit in 2018 as well, but um, you know, she moved on. We've had other sports psychologists since, and all all good. But she was probably the first opportunity, first guru I got it really to. Um, that for me really got me to question and think about uh, start that journey. It's like, okay, well, are we doing the right thing for women? Are we coaching or are we just coaching, you know, 90% of all coaches are men. Are we just coaching what we know mm -hmm. rather than actually thinking about is is this working for it? Is, is this yeah. what the aud our audience yeah. needs? Is this what our customer needs or uh, our athletes need? There's definitely something like, obviously, the chat around the, uh, the road where there's always something BBC will bring up on and uh, some people have mentioned. Uh, something definitely I think we'll, we'll get into in a little bit. I just want to reverse a little bit and just get into the, how you got into rowing first and look at sort of the origin of you and then we'll, ah, we'll go to Cambridge. Troubled past. <laughs> um, and I'm not joking. A little bit of a troubled past. Um you wouldn't be the first one person we've had on who said rowing saved them from, uh, from a, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I, was, I, was, I was a good kid. I just, um, um, I'm half Swedish. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I spent, in periods of my uh, young, uh, well, at the age of four, I lived in Sweden for a year. Um, so when I came back to Australia, couldn't speak English. Um, and then I did another stint when I was 14. And basically, I went to a school where there was a lot of drug problems and stuff and never wanted to and never touched the stuff in my life. But um, when you try and stand out from basically a culture, you, there's bullying. And I've been this tall since. I mean, I'm 202, seven, six foot seven, And I have been that height since I was 17, uh, 14 years old. Wow. Um, so, again, stand out. 
Um, but I wouldn't say I was that strong. <laughs> didn't you know? Didn't really do any sports because I was I, I grew nine inches in a year or something like that. Wow. Um, so anyway, so I basically just was a bit lost, and so my parents sent me back to Sweden for just a change of scenery and sort of thing. And then when I came back to uh, Australia, um, while in Sweden, I learned a bit of truancy because um, no one was taking a register. So like, okay, well I'll go do that or do this or whatever. Um, and also, uh, well, there's a bunch of reasons, but um, so, but I would not be here without that because I wouldn't have gone to Adelaide High School as a uh, 16-year-old, and um, which is the only at the time was the only state school in, in Adelaide where I grew up um, that taught that offered rowing, mm-hmm. and um, fell in love with it pretty much day one. Um, I, you know, sat in the crew and stuff, and then I would cycle. I would get up early and cycle to the boathouse, which was twenty kilometers away, because wow. um, I lived in Glenelg, uh, meaning most in the, to the center of Adelaide. And um, I would take out the sort of the, the learning single and taught myself to scull. Had to unteach a lot of that, but anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, it's like you know, left about right. Yeah, no, I taught myself right above left, <laughs> um, and yeah. And I fell in love with it. And I think by my second year, I was trialing with the uh, Sports Institute or trying to get into the Sports Institute. And, you know, that was that was tough. Uh, more from a, like, you know, I don't don't come from a sporty background, like from parental perspective, like neither of them did sport. Mm. Um, I think that did golf, yeah. um, which is unusual because I'm average in my family. I am the norm. My dad is six foot eight. My brother is six foot eight. My mother is six foot one. Very normal. I've got an aunt who's six foot two. Uh, I've got a female cousin who's six foot two. And it, you know, we're not a small family. That's incredible. But almost no sport other than golf. Um, and I, not a fan of golf. Uh, <laughs> and I'd rather take the dogs for a walk. The um, don't quote my wife's not allowed to see that because you know. More walking. Um, <laughs> the uh, so yeah. So essentially, I went to Adelaide High School, found rowing, and then that was you know. I think by the end of the first year, I was doing twice a day, six days a week with a bike ride on a Sunday. Hope um, that, yeah, yeah. And it became and it very much as like I felt like a. I think I don't know if it, how for other people, but I felt like I belonged in something. Mm. And I found an identity and found other people who were tall, uh, unusually tall at a young age. Um, yeah, so that was all really nice. Just a bunch of other nutters who are willing to also do something 14 times yeah. a week, yeah. And also somewhere where you can like just expel your competitive spirit out and just put it out onto something and actually get get better at it and not get scolded for it if applied in the wrong way. Yeah, I mean, you, you say that. I, I, I you know, it's like... My both my parents would have described me as non-competitive, and and it's interesting. It's like is that a, a nature or a nurture? Mm. And I actually think that's uh, uh, you are quite often what you are told to be. And I had a very you know, um, uh, I'm 15 months older than my brother, so we pretty much did everything together. Mm. And when it comes to and also I mean grew later than me. Bizarrely, I grew really early. He didn't grow heavy his growth until he was 17. Um, that must have been fun for a while. <laughs> Nine inches over here. Well, yeah. Brother. Yeah, was, I mean, I was always taller, but he had he had the he had the gob. I, I may have had other assets. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, so I mean, we were competitive and he would generally be a bit more talented at some of like you know, the things that were cool and when we were growing up was skateboarding, surfing, um, and I was rubbish at all of them. Um, turns out that you know later on I've discovered that eighty percent of the bones of my feet are fused. I'm not going to be a great jumper with the bones like that. Mm-hmm. So and uh, you know so you start to go actually well there's reasons for this and you know that's that's a uh, a story about you know how some of these things create your worth and actually they've got nothing to do it. It's just this is who you are and, and I remember going see when I found that out I was a um, he basically said yeah you picked the perfect sport. Like rowing your feet, it's going to be fine. Um, jumping, yeah, not going to be great. Um, so yeah, so I just fell in love with the sport. Um, 
and then carried that on for in Australia. And what was the yes. decision to to move? Um, so I, I mean, never never quite made the straight. So in 1995, I basically burnt out. Like I had fallen in love with the sport, and that's all I did, mm. pretty much. Um, I got a part time job. Um, I'm a pretty good sign writer these days, but like but then the skills I learned, but um, you know, I don't say that. that I what can you design a, I, oh, I can't paint shit, but I can do the <laughs> I can do the graphics. I can uh-huh. stick them on. I can do all of that sort of stuff. Yeah, not intellectually very fulfilling. Um, I wasn't bad at school. I wasn't engaged with it. Wasn't bad at it. Um, so I went off and did a, um, and I think by then I was doing eighteen sessions a week, and but with no no outflow, no income, and it was kind of on the breadline. I was not funded. I was having to you know basically just I was slightly getting poor all the time. And uh, I think it was just all becoming a bit too much. So I quit in 95. Did a little bit of surf boat here and a little bit of this and stuff and uh, went off and did a teaching degree. Um, so I got a Bachelor of Education from Flinders University in 1990. Started in 95, um, finished in 99. And I, I mean, mum's Swedish, dad's Australian. They met in Canada, got married in Sweden went back to Canada, then I came along. Um, so I went back to Australia. So I have always grown up on stories of the world. So I just always like, and having, I think in my schools, uh, certainly my first school, I was probably the only one of four or five that had even left the state, let alone, um, you know, new, you know b- bilingual parents and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, I was like, right, the day I didn't even stay for graduation. The day I knew I'd passed, I had a flight to. Um, I'd done a ski season the year before in the uh, US. It was like first of December, my mum's birthday. Not a high, not a high point. <laughs> um, but so off to the states again and worked in um, South Lake Tahoe, a ski resort for four months. Then went to New Mexico for a friend's wedding and then arrived here. And I was only going to be here for three months wow that old story yeah <laughs> three months and i so i was doing supply teaching in london i think on day three a kid threatened me with his cricket bat i went bold um <laughs> the You're like i'm australian i mean he was like this big you know it wasn't very big <laughs> um apparently i smiled the wrong way or something but um the Literally, we were walking across the square. I had, had not said a word. Um, anyway, so the I, basically, I was meeting a friend in Putney, saw there was running going on, wandered down. Uh, a little voice started going. Yeah, and I walked to the thing. So, a guy called Dave Wise, um, who knows that he's the reason that, that for this whole journey, but because um, I tell him at Henley every time I see him, <laughs> the probably on a Saturday when I've had one too many. Um, and he was just tinkering with an old boat and stuff. The 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 Thames Rowing Club at the time was away on training camp, so there was no one around. So it was a thing. They showed me thing and seeing a tank. Never seen a tank in my life. Um, that thing's down buried under concrete oh, or something, yeah. and a new one's been built. Uh, you no, know? yeah. And um, the you know it was a asbestos shed and a, yeah. Was, but um, so I said, yeah. Give it. Oh, I'd like to just do some recreational. I've done it seriously. Don't really want to do it again. But I'd like to meet other people than teachers, because otherwise, I'm gonna, um, I'm just not gonna last very long. Because it was, it's unfortunately the supply teaching world is not very positive. You know, yeah, it's, it's you always get. We rarely do get good classes, mm. uh, and understandably, and I was one when I was a kid. You, behaviorally, you're not necessarily the nicest to those supply teachers. Um, you know, I got, I got told once it's like, yeah, just don't leave any let anyone leave a classroom. I'm like, hmm. so I'm a bouncer for a day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the you know, I, I've seen most of London because of it, which is quite nice. But I had a teacher different at school who um, he was telling us like he used to work in a rough school where they'd have a panic button. Literally, they pass under the table if it really kicked off. <laughs> and he said, he said, oh, I really shouldn't have, but sometimes I just. I just knew if I wound them up till they went mad, I could press the button and two guys would walk in and take them out of the classroom. So <laughs> it, we'd just play the game. Look. Yeah. Um, I won't say his name. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, I didn't have my panic button. Yeah. Um, but I definitely got asked back occasionally. 
Um, no one left the classroom. The um, not helpful on the day. Then they didn't tell me there was two doors. I'm like, it's not. I can stop people leaving this door, but I can't stop both doors. Um, it's literally that. It's playing goalkeeper. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's you know, uh, and it, yeah, the so you know wasn't going to do this seriously. One week later, mm-hmm. suddenly I was back to ten <laughs> solid took. Yeah, one week. Uh, the because apparently the moment I left. I'd done a couple of sessions and um, Tessa at uh, Imperial College mm. used to coach it. Um, she's got an interesting story if you want to go back into the history. But anyway, um, she was coaching. Uh, Simon Cox was the head coach at the time at Thames. And uh, so apparently, like I'd done one session and Tessa was on the phone. It's like, um, it's pretty good. Um, unfit, but pretty good. Um, and uh, yeah, and then... Um, I started meeting with the team and really enjoyed it. It was a good thing. Um, I was still I was living up in Finsbury Park, I think, so it was a bit of a hell of a community. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, well, um, just a bunch of people and a created environment felt like home. And that's I will never be a not a not to be a member of Temp Train Club just because it gave me uh more of a um that more that home mm-hmm. element that you that was really nice especially about being in a new city and stuff and uh yeah so anyway i was supposed to be going to a teaching job in north carolina i called up and said yeah i'm not coming because i made friday my first handling yes. and um you know back uh in 2000 that was that was 2000 and uh the rules were a little different you could turn up year on year there was no month until the following year and um, I was like, so, and we lost the final the following year in 2001. Um, and then, uh, so that was the at- Thames Cup. And then uh, 2002, got the Friday again, and then won in 2003, um, which are, you know, kind of one of the lucky ones. It's not, there's not that many of us who actually, you know, there's a lot of people who want to win one. There's not that many who do. Well, the Red Box at Henley or the, this particular cup? No, no, wait, no, the the Wi Fi uh, is a it's I've got a red box. Yeah, yeah. I don't have one at this table. I think I'm the only one here who doesn't. But yeah, I've um, got, but I've only got one. Yeah, yeah, me too. One is all you need. Yeah. <laughs> got a coaching and I'm pretty proud of the coaching one too. But that's uh um I was gonna say, so this time at Thames, have you done any coaching up to this point in rowing? Not no, back home, not at all really. So after O three, when we won, I was actually uh, like I was doing most of my training at Thames because I was um I just bought a house with my now wife and um you know so we you know i was down that path so i was then but i was actually training at brooks so i was rowing on weekends with um with brooks um and doing a doing a we did a four i think that year we did the fours head i did uh disqualified but anyway, <laughs> uh danny Merritt and uh tommy burton i've rowed with both of them i was Goodness. in the visitors four with danny in 2009 it was not one of his wins. Unfortunately. <laughs> I think by when I rode with them, um, I think between the two of them, they'd won 13 minutes. 13 yeah, that was the thing. Yeah. It's like, I really want to get Tommy on. I think he'd be, oh, be a good laugh. Yeah. Uh, both of them would be a good banter. I uh, think Alex Partridge, that was his two suggestions. Yeah. Danny, Tommy, and Adam Moffat. He wanted them three in a room. Yeah. Uh, well, I've rode with all three. So, okay. yeah. And uh, I was just, he, uh, he was a young fella at yeah. Brooks at the time. Um, yeah, they were all, you know, so did that. But then, you know, uh, Paul Reedy, who I've known since I was 19 years old, uh, basically said, you know, about, you know, the the older 20s. I was 30 when I won. So um, it's like once you've won, you've retired. You don't know it yet, but you've retired. And that's kind of what happened is like I started to, like for the first time, I'm like I'm a pretty earnest trainer. I, lo- I like training. I like the routine. And I just started to notice like, mm, yeah, I can mm. 10 minutes here or stuff. And it's like, I'd rather go to the pub or anything. So things just slowly eke off. Mm-hmm. And I woke and I, we got married in February of 2004. And uh, and I did the thing the following weekend, I went over to, I was at Brooks and said, look, I'm, I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to leave you high and dry. I'll do the head with you um, uh, because I don't want to leave. And, you know, think if you need me, I'm, I'm there. Uh, because I think entries were already in, and uh, anyway, the and it was a pretty cool crew. Even though that race got disqual- uh, cancelled, but 
Um, the but I th- you know it's not fair to I know what I'm doing. It's not fair for everyone else. Yeah. Um, and uh, Henry will never admit this, but but I came out. Henry went in. Oh no, that was Will. So my pair's partner. So there was two of us. We weren't up there. So Will broke, busted his knee. So Henry came in for uh, for Will, and then I kind of thing, and then an Oxford guy sat in for that Henley. I can't remember his name, but um, I'd like to think I would have got there with him um, because that they won again that year. Mm. Um, uh, I'm quite proud of the fact that we beat them in 2003 at, at uh, Marley. Yeah. It's quite yeah. It's, you know, it's like when you know you you look back at the races that count. So I I won my Henley with an easily verdict. I don't really you know I remember the journey, but I don't mm-hmm. remember the thing. But I remember that race against um, Brooks, a third of a length, the whole way down the course. <sighs> 16 seconds on, I think Cambridge and then a couple more to Oxford. It was like, it's like, um, well spread out field. And we were the only Thames Cup, uh, only Wyfold eligible crew. We're knowing that Brooks is going to, it's like, okay, well, if we can win that, you know, this, it's, it's ours to lose, as it were. Yeah. Like I said, the mental, that's yeah. it. You, you know, you can. And you know, everyone else is now trying to pick another event. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, yeah. So that's, uh, Thing. And as I say, didn't uh, had had uh, I guess I'd done a little bit of coaching in Australia to make ends meet. Mm. Um, interesting. It had been it had been a, a girls' school at the time, um, probably coincidentally. But there we go. And yeah, but um, so we get. I think it was November of two thousand four. Um, the captain of Thames, a guy called Stephen Dooley. Uh, it was a friend and stuff, but called up and said, look, not particularly happy with the way things have like gone over the last year and a bit. Would you, I'm about to have the tough conversation with the coach. Would you be willing to take over? Um, I've talked to your old coach and he suggested that you'd be a good thing, good candidate. I'm like, so I had to have a conversation with my wife. It's like, you know, that time that I did rowing, well, it's about to get a lot more. <laughs> uh, or it could be if you're up for it. I mean, yes, but we're getting a dog. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a trade-off. No. Did you ever think, was that, did you ever in your mind think that it was something you'd like to do? Or was I it did, kind of spread I did as you? a young person, yeah. I did as, I really enjoyed coaching the uh, young people and, and stuff. And I, I love the, I love the learning about rowing in terms of, uh, my coach in Australia used to say that I would, I would happily talk about like what part of the stroke I could feel things. And he said, not everyone can do that. Mm. Um, I only had one person say that to me, but there we go. Uh, you know, not everyone can say things like, yeah, I can feel that through my big toe sort of thing. And um, uh, so, yeah, no, I and I loved being able to sort of explain those things because as much as I was, uh, I, I told you I had three different secondary schools, not the best for your academic prowess mm-hmm. um, in two different countries especially. The um, So I had... Um, but I had a real love for physics, and mm-hmm. I guess if life had gone a different path, engineering would have definitely been like I love engineering. One of my, um, uh, I, I, one of the people that stands out in my time here is a young woman called um, Larkin, who was president actually in the year of um, cancellation, and she's uh, about to race her crew from that year, almost all of them, uh, are racing ahead of the Charles this year because nice. they've been nice anyway. So. So Larkin is a MIT engineer, came here, solar cells for satellites. I'm like, yeah, that's very cool. That's so cool. Um, and, you know, we, there's lots of very cool things that they do. But um, being with the engineering mechanical bit, yeah, that was... You sort of are a uh, biomechanical engineer. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Half the job. Engineering is yeah. pretty captivating for rowers, mine, I imagine. Like, it's, it's kind of like solving solving problems, but it's something that, you know, you can really adapt yourself to just like rowing and it, it won't have an end unless you give it one. No, absolutely. Yeah, and it's interesting. Here we go through phases, like we'll have other engineers. At the moment, we've got a mass amount of medics and vets, which are they... <laughs> That's got to be hard to work with. Uh, from a logistics perspective, yeah, yes. yeah, not be, not because they're, no, yeah. I just mean like time. <laughs> I mean, occasionally they they start to go all doctor and it's like, are you qualified? No, then shut up. <laughs> um, we actually have doctors on the you know 
no, actually one of them is a doctor and we've got met proper, you know, graduated experienced sports doctors. So you stop diagnosing things that you actually, you know, you're not qualified. <laughs> the training comes <laughs> diagnosis. Yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah. Um, Band-Aid, you can do that. Um, but let's not go reading x-rays or anything like that. And it's like, <laughs> that's, it's, it's not your pay thing. Um, but, you know, they're curious and stuff and things like that. But uh, it's also scary how little they know in certain areas. But that's another topic. Um, so you fell into the coaching role. At pretty much. I got asked and hadn't planned it. I was like, I was like, I was a teacher. I was going to write, I'm going to do this. Married, newly married. What's, whatever was coming next mm -hmm. on that sort of thing. So, and, uh, and I'd give, you know, I think I was, 31 at this point I was like I'd given a fair amount of time to to the sport um I'd do a bit of fitness like a lot of retired rowers and maybe do a bit of sculling and just keep recreationally stay fit or fitter enough balance out the beer um and uh but yeah and then it yeah and so I did three years so uh from 04 to 07 at Thames, uh, as I said, um, we had we had, you know, a lot of club rowing. This is definitely as much as about uh, recruiting as university and stuff it is these days. It's uh, we even schools do it these days. So um, the we were lucky enough to like we had um, uh, Brian Hoffman from the states. We had. Um, Andy Green, who actually it was in Oxford College and done some trialing. Um, we had uh, Larry Wells, who um, was learned to row at Leeds. I want to say it was at York, one of those two. Um, and then Tom Otis Moss, who'd done the boat race in two thousand one. And um, you know, the Tom was the coach in the boat. I'm the second year row, uh, second year, I think probably first year. Also dealing with my father was passing at the time so that was a bit you know it was a bit of a distraction um yeah he died henley week <laughs> not you know it is what it is but it's like so i was actually on a plane going home when they when they both lost the finals but uh as i should have been um but uh it was you know it's um uh, it was a privilege thing we you know i have curry with those guys still to this day um when i came to london it's like it's like I've always got a plan in a slightly later session the next day. Uh, <laughs> you get on the water, I'll meet you out there. I don't believe that, guys. Um, <laughs> the and then and then we won the following year with uh, three of that four. Um, uh, Andy Green had come out, and a guy called Ian Ian McCaig, uh came in. Um, you can look him up. He's uh, he's one of the yeah. I mean, all of them have gone on to big things and stuff, but Ian uh, is probably the entrepreneur of the group who, uh, you've heard of Fit, F-O-O-T? Yeah. Yeah, he's one of the founders. Um, <laughs> he's doing okay. He's doing all right. Um, but interestingly, like, he doesn't, he, because he came into an already existing group, it, there's a different dynamic to mm -hmm. the year before. And that, I think that's a very interesting part of, you know, people who do multiple years versus individual years and how that dynamic changes, but. Um, certainly see that here every now and again, but, um, so getting in, I mean, how was the, the shift then from rower to coach? Did you find it easy? I mean, were there difficult bits? Did you struggle to get out of that row mentality? I mean, when we spoke to Tim Foster, I mean, we both sort of thought that I struggled to like, not, uh, care about them as if they were me, you know, like to think of every athlete, like it became really difficult making cuts and, and dealing with that pressure and that sort of stuff. Um, Definitely. I mean, I think, and I think those are, um, I think that's part of your journey mm. to learn how to separate those two things out. I was pretty certain, you know, I'd rode with these guys the year before or quite a few of them. And then suddenly I was their coach and that was quite, uh, making decisions about their future. Mm. And I know that I'm almost certain that I'm not as close to some of them or it took that some of that, those relations took a dent because then, but that's the path I chose. And, you know, I remember one of the, uh, the Thames old boys saying to me, I didn't think you would be able to do that, mm. but, um, you kind of, 
uh, uh, you know, you do your. I tried my best to, with seat racing and stuff to to to, to be open about these things but, and to show where we were and stuff. But in the end, you just go, okay, guys, this is where we are. This is the decision I'm making. It's like we're not going to do an eight. We're going to do a four. Or and these are the things like, um, yeah. And so, as but interestingly, a lot of those guys who took that hit initially have probably come back into my life like you know there are different parts of the world and stuff like that but i still get um the last two years i've got a message from one of them you know he lives in darkest north of, uh north scotland but i get a message every year going you know congratulations it's been doing that for a while but uh which is nice but there we go um yeah, so, yeah. at the moment when you're part of it it's uh uh, you can we're talking with Al Sinclair about this. You can you can show them every piece of evidence that shows why they shouldn't be in the crew, and they'll still sit down and go. Well, but I disagree with you because it's because they're there for them, and yeah. So it takes a few years sometimes. You can look back and be like, I can appreciate what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I think, and the, um, I I guess I would be um, surprised if someone didn't argue their case yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. But you know, you, you, I guess when it, so we get reviewed every year and rightly so, you know, the students get their take on like how the season's gone and stuff like that. And, um, and you know, maybe it's like, well, you win, therefore you don't, it's like, well, no, actually I've had some pretty grueling reviews um, and we've still won, but, and I've had some great reviews and we've won. So I think that's quite um, informative too. It's like, I think, uh, I guess we're jumping around a bit, a bit but I, one of my f things I'm learning is that actually, uh, I mean, I have to make tough decisions and stuff. And, and for those things, I not necessarily might not be liked as a head coach. Most maybe I would, I was, uh, I had better, I had different relationships. I think is a way of putting it with um, as an assistant coach than I do with head coach. And that's probably one of the toughest things. I guess it, it's a reminder of the. That that change back in two thousand four, but uh, it's a really it's a really big thing. And what I think is interesting, having done both worlds, as an assistant coach, there's probably no one that knows the head coach better or knows what they're thinking or what they're doing or what their job is. But it's only when you become head coach that you're like, oh, this is different. Like I thought I knew what this was, but yeah. now the buck stops with me, yeah. and this is different. And you have to act different, and you have to treat your athletes different, and you have to be a different person. Yeah. And the expectations on me at this role are much different to, you know, Thames had won once. Yeah. When I took over, they had won once and I'd won it. And they, had, <laughs> they, and, they, and they hadn't won for 47 years previous to that. So wow. it's like, you know, you know, do a do a good job and it's going to be fine. Yeah. Um, and, and you can also do make a Friday, make a Saturday. There's more than one outcome. Yeah. Yes, and yeah. people can be happy with it too. Is not just an expectation of win or you've you've essentially failed. It's oh, different. You know, we're in the men's captain's room uh, in Goldie Boathouse, and if you look around, there's no margins. It's just win or lose, yeah. like, along with your name. Yeah, going back to 1829. Wow, um, well, I was in what corner over there? So, you know, it's like and above here is the well, that 2019. Uh, it well, it's actually yeah, it was on the table here. There's two 2019 and 20s. They're about to be put up, but oh, just over there. Over there. Um, but they get hand painted each year, but they do a batch of them, yeah, just because they're much of cost and stuff. But unfortunately, that's what history remembers. So you've either won or yeah. you've or you've lost, and that's it. Yeah. But you say that, and I get like, yo, you've had a great year. It's like one of a few yeah <laughs> and and we've had a great year because we did a clean sweep uh you know and when we say clean sweep there's like we had a clean sweep in 2018 and then the clean sweep like the clean sweep before that was actually 25 years before that so it they're not had oxford has more of them we've had um interesting the i think so anyway but the difference about this clean sweep is the alumni won the spares won the there wasn't a single mm. crew the last whereas that's not always been the case but they're not thing and i think the the changes to one club uh i wouldn't say it's always been smooth but you know for um, we've all got the past and stuff and every single one of the coaches came from 
what the club was before. And so we had to figure out how that all looked and stuff, and that's taken time. Um, and I think probably still will take a little bit more time as we sort of um, let go of some of the – and it is about letting go about stuff, um, or it is for me. The um, That's another thing that's sort of spoken about a lot, you know, when, when in reference to Cambridge, like, oh, they've become one squad, they've become one squad. Yeah. It's really, like, talked about a lot. And yeah. So it's not something – again, it's not something that just happens. No, no, and I think um, – you know, it's like we can talk about Cabersham. Cabersham is one squad, mm. but it's two it's two groups. The training camps are apart and stuff oh, yeah. like that and yeah. stuff. And I think, you know, we're we're figuring out where those things so we did a training camp together last year and there was lots of positives about going on camp together, but they were all off the water. Mm. Yeah. Um didn't add any value to what we did on the water being at the same place, but it was the off water stuff that was quite uh, quite good. They got to um, hang out and become like get to know each other a bit better and play cards and mm. eat together and stuff. Although they're boys and girls, so they tend to eat separately. But um, the <laughs> I'm not joking. Um, happens at primary school. Happens at university. Um, the so you know we're going to try doing separate training camps this year because we want a diff slightly different outcomes from our camps. Um, which is fine. So I think, I think, and I think, you know, we didn't have a camp in 2021. We, um, oh, sorry, 20, well, 2022, because of it was still in COVID and there was like, is it the right thing to travel and that sort of stuff? And so we just, we did a Tideway camp, it was, which is actually a really good camp. Um, I would glad we weren't on the Tideway this time around because it was very cold in England. Uh, when it was cold in um, Spain when we were there, but it was really cold here. Um, the yeah, so you know we're off to different training camp venues this year. Uh, I can't tell you where because it's uh, classified. Uh, well, no, it's not that. It's just like well, I wouldn't want to say something and then we go somewhere else because yeah, something's yeah. fallen through. Yeah, so it's still being sorted. Um, uh, but I'll be enjoying some gelati hopefully. Um, Okay, <laughs> I think that's a, that's a good clue. The yeah, and I mean the so yeah, so we, we're going to enjoy, we're going to try that, and we'll learn from that, reflect, and then maybe you know maybe it's something we do like a one training camp. Thing. So it's a, it's also really hard to find somewhere that can house a hundred people. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's also not all that easy. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's that's yeah, so we're still looking at that that and. Um, you know, but um, I mean, it was an incredible like. You know, it, it's like with one hand, you know the the statistics. Like we had incredible buy in from all members across all three um, legacy clubs about being the this there's the there was the people said no to, but like ninety percent and up, well, everyone was in favour of it. So, um, and the club's gone, um, and I think. Yeah, we've all everyone's working their way through and trying to come up with a um, what does this look like, uh, as well as holding on to you know we don't want to like you'll still see the women with their red and yellow stripes and mm -hmm. white stripes because that's the legacy of the history of their clubs and you know the red stripe is around the they weren't a, they weren't women weren't allowed to have a, a clean, a clean yeah. strip so there's 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 holding on to this thing, some of those things. And I think if the club wants to go to one pit, I, I suspect there's a pathway, but there's a way of respecting everyone in them, which um, balance out with costs and all the other things. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, I thankfully don't have to um, have those discussions and ask my opinion. I say it, but it's like, you know, I'm, um, you know, I'm not a member, you know, it's like, and, because the membership, the structure of this club is that you race the race and then you're a member. Mm. You're not you're not a member just because you trialed. Um and so yeah. So it's like um but you know it's a pretty cool job to have. I guess I guess the part of you know setting the standard and leading the way from do, in doing something that other clubs potentially aren't doing is, is just accepting and there will be a, a period of time where you just have to try things out and then see which structures to implement and then maybe you'll try something for a period of time and it will not work just like training out this 
they're trying out those training camps in different places, merging them, the way that you train, uh, doing pieces, sharing the boathouse and everything. But I think overall, it's definitely a step that uh, has been perceived very positively in the in the rowing community. Mm-hmm. And I think why what in the in the modern world why why separate right why if you can if you can use and share the resources there's more to be gained from the from the unity of of the squad and people getting on rather than also creating internal rivalries that can sometimes just get in their way of progress for Hmm. essentially essentially no reason yeah i mean and this club's rife with uh like if you go back into the past there's you know there's frictions between the lightweights and the open weights and and stuff and how the races are treated and stuff and that's that's the past uh i you know if you just look say on the i mean the women have always been one club so it's a, there's always been an element of like imogen for example doing the lightweight race stepping in stepping up and wanting to then do the open weight race and um you know that and on the men's side you know um there's several members over the last few years who've actually been making that transition. It's like, yeah, I'm going to do a lightweight race, and actually, I want to see if I can push myself to go even faster and and compete with the open weights, um, and I guess no dieting as well. But um, always a perk, I imagine. Uh, a row. Yeah. The yeah. So yeah, I think we're doing uh, a, a really a good job, and we're learning and. Communication is always improving, and we're trying to, uh, you know, each year we support each other a bit more. Um, and and I don't mean that like that, you know, that we're doing it begrudgingly. I mean it's like actually you start to realize that we can start supporting each other because your job is like to look after your athletes, but actually there's crossover and we can try and help each other a little bit. Uh, I think it doesn't cost us anymore. We probably just makes it easier and stronger for, yeah. for it. Yeah, I've realized that from like, being on the other side from coaching and stuff. It's uh, um, you take that rose mentality to coaching and like, well, how much better can we get? And how can I tweak this? And how can I do that bit? And like you said, and what P said, like you can get really stuck with uh, the fear of failure. It can stop you from progressing, I think. So that's something that you have to have the confidence and to know that sometimes you'll change things and get it wrong. Um, I did home countries this year with Wales and I, I sort of remember, I sort of this thought it's thinking like, well. No, no, I don't. My parents moved to London. I was born in London, so I don't sound it but from there. My wife's um, name is Sean. Um, yeah, I mean, I think my first, I sort of thought, I remember thinking at the end, that was the first time I'd sort of really been involved in logistics, trailers, boats, really like took that kind of role on four. Yeah, it's not the highest level event, but it's a world rowing event. I mean, yeah. that's sort of what comes with that. And just thinking, God, these rowers have no idea what gets done for them. Yeah. And then the second thought being like, but because all the star support staff are specifically working towards making sure that the rowers have no idea what's being done for them. Like in terms of not, not, not saying it, but like the whole point is get them focused on their job and, and we'll take care of everything yeah. else. So part of the job sort of is doing that. Um, yeah. I was going to ask like, how is that, how is that different? Obviously, like we said, we talked about this kind of race, it's win or lose this squad system, like compared to, to London in terms of their, are there, is there a different way you approach it? What's, um, I mean, uh, if you watch back to, uh, well, some of the early interviews, sort of like, say, Cleaver this year, so I don't talk about Oxford. I can't control them. No. Nah, yeah. um, acknowledge they're our opposition. That's our job to go out and do the best we can against them. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some joint agreements and stuff like that we review because I would be negligent if I didn't. But in the end, it's like, okay, well, that's what it is. Let's put it away, and now let's focus on our job. And our job is to go as fast as we possibly can because, and if that's not fast enough, and that's that's that feeling on morning of 2022. It's like, fuck, we're out. If, if Oxford could beat that, it's off because that's quick. Mm-hmm. And they can beat that, you know, and both crews beat the previous record, um, then then that's going to be a phenomenal race. And um, you start to look for things, other reasons why it's just, it's joyful, the um, the teaching, the spending time, the, I do not always enjoy admin, but at the same time, I really enjoy my time on the water. Getting up at 5 a.m., I have done for now 11 years. Um, I have never pressed snooze. Um 
spend that time. I, you know, the alarm goes off, I get up and I go make my coffee, well, have a shower, go make my coffee, sit, read the news or something, check on the emails, do some like, oh, someone's ill, sort that out. <laughs> and then off to the boat club, I go and meet them and off we go do our session and, and then the day begins. Um, but, uh, Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, what's different? Uh, On the face of it, yeah, cross the finish line first. Um, what yeah. else completely is different? I guess in terms of... I mean, it's a privilege to have that mindset. You know, would I be in the same situation if I was at Oxford? And, and, but, like, I don't think we should be sort of going through the, um, and I think, the thing I struggle with or have struggled with at times is the, when we start talking about hating Oxford. Mm -hmm. It's like, but some of my best friends went to Oxford. Mm. And then they're still my friends. And actually, I won my Henley medal with two guys who went to Oxford. And it's like, um, what happens on the water? Stay on the water. Let's be mates off the water. And and I know there's the sort of where where you get it to in your rowing career has a has a, that can be reflective in that. But I don't. I don't, I don't, it's certainly, well, on the women's side, it's not a motivator to, mm. to hate your opposition. Mm -hmm. Um, the, uh, they want to win, but, but they want to, they also want to go fast. They want to have, they want to have, uh, have a positive experience. They want to, they want to, they want to do well at their academics and stuff. And they're not willing to, um, they're not willing to compromise their academics just mm. for rowing. Um, that has probably changed a. It's, that's changed a little bit, but underlying for the majority, it's like no, I'm. You know, some do come here to row, but most come here for the academics and the adding to their network, to their um, their learning, the thing, and then they get to do this cool thing called the boat race. Yeah, it's like yeah. Um, but I agree. I agree with you. Like hating Oxford doesn't doesn't make your boat go any faster, and. That's just shouldn't be the sole mo motivator. We were just speaking with someone called Dave Bell. You might recognize him. No, Dave, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he said that um, the, the rivalry between Oxford and Cambridge is quite interesting, but ultimately it should be predicated on the mutual respect because it doesn't need to go any further than this. And Yeah, we were talking about how we, FDT is pretty crass. And uh, he said the GDBO, which I think is gosh down bloody Oxford, which I think is such a great response. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I can't blame crews sometimes to try and grip hold of whatever they feel, um, you know, whether they, you want to hate a club or not. But like you said, it's it's really as motivating as you as you make it and you can pick something else. Yeah. And you don't want to give the opposition a reason. Like I think FTT, if I rode for Cambridge, would, you know, light me on fire. Like, all right, let's go. Yeah. Like you've just given me a bit more. Yeah. Uh, I think there's, a, I don't know the exact details, but I think there's a story of um, one of uh, Matthew Pinson's first worlds where he makes a comment about the Russians' tracksuits and then the Russians go kick his ass. Um, it's like, you, yeah, you don't give your opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's like, you just, like, one, why would you give them fuel? But also, you can't control them. Yeah. And there is, you know, the we've each got our own, things in our box that we can control or we can like we can cope with on the day why are we going to add something that we can't control so trying to trying to teach them those skills is actually thing and so yeah we don't talk about off um you want to talk about the win streak we don't talk about things like um i worry i personally worry about it like you know i worry that and i think it's the uh it's actually something that the the all blacks book uh, legacy told me is like if we're not if the moment we stop thinking about going faster and we think about actually, well, we've got this big win streak, we'll lose. Mm -hmm. um, and that goes on not just me, but that goes on their mindsets, the, how they tackle training. And because like if you're coming to Cambridge because we win and you think that's it, that's not, you know, we're not going to keep winning um, or we're not going to have great races. And actually for me, I want to have great races. I want to have great races for women's rowing. Mm -hmm. I think... Um, we're starting to see an increased depth. I think we're almost at the point where there's more women rowing than men rowing uh, in this country. Uh, certainly in Australia, that's the case mm -hmm. and has been since I was in my early 20s. Um, so, but let's make sure we're going out and having great racing. You know, uh, if you guys have watched the semi finals of the NCAAs, 
holy crap, you know, difference between A final and B final could be four crews separated by 0.2 of a second sort of thing, 0.4 of a second. It's like, uh, yeah, it's really cool. You know, there might be a crew like a Texas or a Washington that actually mm. does, d is maybe half a length up, but they're only half a length up, not, okay, where is everyone? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not know, easily. It's like, yeah, so I think, there's there's depth and there's a growth and there's a love for our sport in in um thing and and i think one of the the things that you know people watch around the world is the boat race so let's 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 like let's keep winning sure let's we do everything we can to keep holding you know being proud of that um but also let's let's i'm not going to sit here and diss oxford because i want them to have a great race uh, you want to you want to beat the best opponent, do you? Yeah. You don't want your yeah. opponent weakened. You know you want to win, knowing yeah. that you had the best race for sure. Yeah. yeah, and that's and that's and and I and I reflect on you know I went back to like in two thousand and three when I won my Henley medal. It's like I don't remember my my Henley win with like the racing itself, the box. Yes, great, but the race, the great race I had against. Um, Brooks Marley. Now that's the race I remember. Yeah. We oh, yeah. we still talk about as a crew. But it was the, the end. It's like, yeah, yeah, we were two lengths clear by the end of the island. It's like it wasn't a race then, was it? Yeah, as I, say, I tell all my crews, you know, when they've had a close race and they've lost, they're the ones I've remembered the most. I've yeah. lost Henley. I have won Henley once. I've also lost it by six foot, three feet, and one foot. One yeah, foot it's... lost in the plate it was my closest, and but I'm, it's, a, it's an incredible race to be yeah. a part. Of. It was yeah. incredible noise, and I can I can think the ifs and buts. But at the end of the day, yeah. like it's very difficult in the moment when you've just lost yours by a foot yeah. to believe what's being told you. But I think, and over time, those things come. Um, yeah, we, we naturally want to look back and go, actually, yes, I remember um, elements of that that, you know, I, I remember a reflection on choices I made and mm -hmm. stuff. And actually, you know, and as long as we sit back and in the end going, well, actually, this is this is my past and, this is, and these are all the things I'm proud of and I can acknowledge my mistakes, then... Man, I, I've had great experiences, and it's made me a better human being. You have to make mistakes. If you're not making mistakes, you're not trying. So you I'm have to have the, the yeah. confidence to do that. Um, I wanted to ask then, yeah, talking about um, what your focus is here. Obviously, moving from Thames and having nothing to lose to being here and it being win or lose, and then finding yourself position of having the the queen's the clean sweep. Um, you sort of said yourself once you got that red box in your own growing career, just sort of tailed off. How? How do you not let that happen? How do you keep going? How do you bring something new to the table? And I think that's where the gurus come in. It's like you keep being inquisitive about the things you don't know. Yeah. And I'm still learning. Um, and I think the the one of the things that, you know, you could talk about the amount of research that is actually out there on women's specific um, sport and the, you know, there's plenty of people advocating that. But um we should be asking ourselves questions of, okay, well, so this is how I was taught. I was taught by um, a male, and actually, let's acknowledge not they're not the differences between men and women, and how the the physical makeup, the 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 you know internal and external, um, and what can we be doing to. Uh, coach to the strengths mm. not just coach because that's how rowing's supposed to be done mm -hmm. and so um you know sort of tapping into and exploring as like you know grace was incredible f for me you know it's in terms of like oh you set your boat up like that but but you're tall and um you know but you've actually got the handles quite low and stuff like and um, it's not my place to to share the measurements so the but you know the way she she was set up in the boat makes you really think about actually well yeah women are stronger in the legs and the and the hips than in the upper body so let's make sure that we're rigging in a way that enhances those strengths not you know we talk about it you know and coaching is about like let's identify our weaknesses and stuff but let's mm -hmm. also identify our strengths and mm -hmm. go how can we you know we want our weaknesses to not break us, but there are some things that we're not going to overcome. Mm -hmm. You know, the 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 balance between upper body and lower body strengths 
male to female is always going to be different. Mm. There might be a couple of outliers, but as overall in a team yeah. sport, they're always going to be different. So let's start thinking about how we can row to those strengths rather than thing. And um, I, I hope there are lots of other male coaches because we're so many of us who are also thinking of those lines. But uh, I think the the majority coach what they know and that's been, I've been lucky to be able to get paid to do this so I have more time to to reflect than most because mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's I think that's what I would say is one of our strengths is that and I encourage my t the team the athletes to be asking those questions is this right for us or and I don't say well just because you think so that's the way it is it's mm -hmm. actually like well okay then let's find out what the what we can be doing differently and be inquisitive and you know let's find out more about how we can uh the menstrual cycle about um you know what's happening to our bodies at different times of the month and so therefore you know we can't move the races so i'm not going to say well we do less but how what do we need to put in place to support you to be able to be your best or to think on those days and you know I saw some research in with football about how um, it was like ACL tears and stuff were so much more prominent, prominent at certain times based on what else was going with physiology and things like that. And you just think, from as a, from a coaching hat, it's like, I feel it's quite exciting to think, you know, to, and it's like you said, working with men in sport, there's not really, everyone's on nutrition, everyone's on physiology, that's kind of there. And in women's sport, you're like, there's this thing that not everyone knows about and we can lean into it. Yeah. And it's like the expression free speed, you know, there's, we might have to grab hold of something that's very rare in high-level sport, I think, in the world today. Yeah. Certainly in men's sport, the, the conventional model. Yeah. But I think we have to, um, you know, you know, the question at the moment is like, what's contraception doing? Yeah. The, the pill is like, you know, so there's those questions and I'm not a medical professional, not even going to go into it. But, the you know, it's, we have athletes on the pill, we have athletes not on the pill, we have other forms of contraception. So we've got to give them the tools to, make the choice that's right for them and give them the support it's like well i'm making this choice and this is the other things i need to be thinking about and also they're young people and they're still trying to figure out what does a performance athlete look like someone who just wants to do sport and so there's there's those balancing acts of trying to create an environment where they can be inquisitive and oxbridge i don't know i'm assuming it's the same certainly thing is that oxbridge are generally perfectionists mm. they hate getting shit wrong mm. Um, so trying to create an environment of where actually no, you know, they hate getting things wrong, but they've got plenty wrong. They just don't necessarily not very good at acknowledge them. I want to try and create an environment where it's safe to make mistakes and try things and go, oh dear, that wasn't a bad, good idea. Oh, I didn't know I could do that. That would be my, like, let's find new levels. But when you're you know, they have lots of, they're, they're smart people. They have lots of conversations in their own heads, let alone with other people. So there's lots of information coming at them. So, you know, they can jump on the bandwagon here and jump on the bandwagon here. So you got to, you got to be pretty clear about what it is you want them to do. I had a great one the other day. I said, look, I want to start this piece at this and then you can do whatever you want. And, I, and then literally I was like, but you want me just to go, just keep going fast, even though the rate's going low? I was like, no, I was, okay, right. Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> um yeah, so it we'll see, but um, I think you're definitely walking in the uncharted territory and probably one of the first people like on, on that path, as, especially Cambridge, like because you can actually like, put a lot of research into into like finding out and asking those questions, like what it is that can be different and improve for women in sport. And I think there's definitely a lot of clubs and chatter around clubs uh, potentially when they don't have the resource, those kind of resources, wondering what is Cambridge doing, how are they finding this out, and how is that benefiting? And is this something that you've done since you came to Cambridge or is this more of the last four or five years sort of thing? Um, so when we were sort of uh, off air, we were um, we were talking a bit about COVID. And I think, um, so Richard Chambers is a friend. Uh, he worked here for a brief period and we have the you know back and forth and there's certainly a group of us that would chat over during COVID about... Um, if we don't always agree but that's which is fine that but um but what we do agree on is that we've got to be um creating more opportunities and create more um 
create one, it, it, for women to explore how to be successful. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, we rare. I think with when we had, I don't believe that when we were learning to win in that first period, when the reality was we weren't having these conversations. You know, the the conversation about the differences between men and women really came out through COVID, mm-hmm. and the lionesses have helped drive that forward and stuff. But um, I, as a young coach, never would have had the confidence to talk about periods and menstrual cycles and stuff. And it's like, no, eh, we just talk about it. It's, it's, why is it a thing? Mm-hmm. Um, 52% of the population have them, so let's just talk about them. Mm-hmm. The, um, and if we can normalize that, then we can talk about the conversations that, oh, you're not having a period. Right, okay, well... That's not okay. So let's talk about how actually like it's not a short term problem, it's a long term problem. So yeah. let's see what we can do to turn that around and offer the support and put those things in the those supports in place. Um, because no one wants an athlete to then you know, we don't do it for ourselves. We do it for because we want to pass on the positive experiences yeah. that we had to to the to to them and we want to and we think we're pretty good at it so we try and pass on the right things um at least that's what i believe but um i think you know there's an element of i just turned 50 so i there's there's each year i think i become i don't give a shit anymore so i'm just gonna do this (laughs) um yeah so I, i think that's I think that's the they're the components that is continuing to make make us successful. Mm-hmm. Um, so I still think you know we, you know we're successful against Oxford. We're still in the mix with the other clubs. You know we don't we haven't done well that well at Henley for a long time. But we have our own challenges when it comes pot race to Henley with academic pressures and stuff, um, as well as bumps and balls and all the other things that the students get to do. It, and I know at Oxford they have the same things in a slightly at slightly slightly different times. Um, you know, as a perfect example, some universities have uh, an exam period that lasts two weeks. Ours lasts three months. Um, wow. It's pretty hard to organise things when you've got those sort of th- those sort of challenges. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess some of those factors that you've named also aren't really a cause or what you'd consider a cause. They're like an effect. So, for example, if you are missing a menstrual cycle then that's that's the effect so you you then like unless you talk about this then you're, you you won't ever get to like the why or the underlying reason of like why that happened in the first place or how can we prevent this into the future or sort of like even viewing the the tangible effects or uh, that on the on the program so would you say that since you've started talking about this more and implementing changes in the program have, have there been any tangible differences notice uh noticeable like what are you looking through the data or in terms of how the squads run the atmosphere things like that i think um since we started talking about it not a large number thankfully but um i'm pretty sure there are people who still aren't confident enough to talk about it yet but um i know some athletes have come to me we've had negative experiences going to the doctor and said oh it's fine it's like how do i report this person because it's not fine not to have your period period um the but the joy is that when you hear and then you put some th- supports in and you empower them to you know to to think about their their diet and and monitor you know just monitoring you know it would be a huge step forward for most 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 clubs and that doesn't cost a lot of money you can make mm-hmm. a google sheet and you know get a kid with a bit of programming and bang you get notifications and everything um you can um you know, just help educate them on how to deal with those stresses, what bras to wear, that, you know, they're not expensive things to, to offer as support. I guess the privilege we have is that we're, I know the, que- I, I, I guess I know, I have the time and stuff to find the questions. So therefore I can have the time to put the, the thing in. If you're you're on your own and trying to do the best and you've got boys and girls and you have the equipment manager and you have everything else, it's like, I don't have any time to do that. And, and I get that. I've been there. Um, the uh, yeah, um, you know, 
we're trying to create the opportunity for them to be athletes and not harm themselves. You know, not having a period leads to osteoporosis. That's bad. Mm -hmm. um, no one needs to be, you know, later in life trying to have kids and your brain, your bones are breaking and stuff, or because you know you tripped or something. It's not. That's just none of that's cool. Um, and the reality is, a society we have all have weaker bones than. Well, you guys do the me because I dug in the soil and kids don't do that anymore and stuff. And maybe that's part of the problem. I don't know. But um, I'm digging at myself there about the soil. But anyway. No, uh, I mean, I, I grew up in Poland, so I definitely used to play around in sand pits yeah, and forest. And stuff, and but a lot of kids don't get to do that anymore and stuff. And, um, you know, we don't play outside. We don't play on trees because of, well, you know, the world's a lot bigger place now than it was in things. And, pros and cons to that but uh, I think you want people yeah you know, obviously you know it doesn't matter what level you're at the higher you get the more that something's going to affect you potentially in a negative way but you know we all do this because we love this sport and you want everyone else to love it yeah. and the best way to get people involved is to is to have them not break themselves you know in the first six months that they do it um, and I also think like from an athlete's perspective you know as you start getting into sport and loving it and you start reading books on you know as getting nutrition books and finding a stretching book and and you and you want to lean into the things and learn all these things it just all becomes part of looking after yourself and that's what's becoming a, a better athlete is mm. um and like you said i like the quote that you have is sort of firing fire yourself mm. from the things you're not good at and you're sort of in a different way it's like okay here's something that we could be working on i know nothing about that let's find someone who does mm. and then learn and then the other thing is even if other clubs can't do what you're doing it's feeling down yeah because that's just how it does. People look at Cambridge, Oxford, squad, what are they doing? We want to do that. So if you have the resources and you can do this, and plus, you know, your athletes will go off and will finish in this system and go to Thames and share that knowledge. So, like, it also feeds down. So I think it's even bigger what you guys are doing than, than just the athletes that you're looking after. And it's yeah. potentially inspirational as well. For sure. Yeah. And... Um you know what Brooks is doing is quite inspirational in terms of finding speed and the depth mm. of their squads and stuff. And you know, they, um, and there will be parts of how they run things that we agree to disagree on, and that's that's absolutely fine. It's there's no there's a way that people will make work, and I think thankfully there's no like this is the only way yeah. that would be really quite boring in this, in the world. But um, yeah, and I think Thames has done an incredible job of, of finding their system uh, that works, and you know. But also, if you look, get in close, and as I'm a lifetime member, but the, um, you know, they're having fun. They're, yeah. There's 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 more than just they're having fun and relaxed, and therefore, and yes, they're they're passionate about the sport, so they're actually learning rather than actually going. You've got to get this right, and the you know the the balance of finding speed and enjoying yourself and learning how to be um you know, mind more mindful about how our presence on ourselves our presence around others and stuff and 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 taking on those things and uh, um I don't know. I think I think the I'm uh, you know that's the next thing I'm going to try and tap into, to, you know, but not not because I want them um, sort of you know, you know meditating or something in the in the corner. I want them to acknowledge you know we we're an incredibly privileged institution. They've worked very hard to get here, mm. um, uh, but we're doing an incredibly. We got this. Guys, I'm a bloody rowing coach from a state school in Adelaide, and I'm talking to you guys, and I've been on the BBC, and it's like, really, really, is this really happening to me? Um, and yes, I've worked hard, but it's also the right place at the right time, and there's, you know, I've been lucky. Um, and but it is rowing, you know, and let's put it into context. It's rowing; it's a big part of our lives. Yeah. I can still walk into Cambridge, and people have no idea what it is that I do, <laughs> and what's the boat race. Um, even in Cambridge, even in Cambridge, the you know go to the barbers and say, like, "What do you do? Uh, running? Coach? No, rowing. What's that? Uh, okay, fine." Um, I remember telling people uh, that I rowed as a, as my job, and they were like, "Oh, you, oh, you teach kids how to row? Yeah. No, no, I row." 
Are you owing people pay you? Well, well sort of, it's a lot of... Yeah, so your taxes pay me, but... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's an interesting one. That's something I did want to ask about. How, how, how did you find that, the, the media, um, having cameras follow you around, interviews... Um, did you struggle with it? Like you said, finding finding your boat on the front page of the of yeah. The so I mean, that was world. that was. I mean, a lot of that. Well, that all fell on Rob. Uh, you know, he was the head coach and and um, yeah, Rob Baker. So the you know we were lucky enough that I mean we've all got always got the opportunity to do media training if we want it. Um, but I think the you know it is rowing. The people, the BBC uh, thing, the the local newspapers and stuff that when they want to interview us, you know, it's like they do a pretty good job of just explaining. It's like, you know, we want, you can tell us if you don't want something included, we won't include it. Um, and because actually they're not looking for a negative story. Mm-hmm. Um, they're looking for... I guess they're, they're looking for a piece to enhance the race. The race is the the big picture. Um, it's what happens on the water, as it should be. It's not, you know, I'm, when I'm done, it will take a couple of years and then I will be just part of history and that will be it. Um, and probably won't even be talked about and et cetera, et cetera. And that's fine. Um, We've heard uh, this year that the media attention will be very focused on one thing. It's the twins on either side. Well, actually, there's possible of two lots of uh, sisters racing each other. Oh, they love that. The media yeah. loves that. Uh, yeah. Because, um, so Helen, uh, what's Helen's last name? So Helen was in Cyrus last year. She's now here. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so she's doing a PGCE. Um, uh, she was in three seat of Cyrus last year. Okay. And then Catherine, yes. So if you um, heard her back, so it hasn't road trade a little bit, but yeah. So the, the twins end up racing each other. That so you can be. just you can palm the media off on them. Yeah, that, that's really uh, very interesting. Well, and you know, and but we'll make the we'll, you know we will also be sitting down with Gemma at some point, and uh, and I hope the same thing will happen for Catherine. Is that you know it's like okay, so we're going to set up some media training days because yeah, it's coming. It's well, even if it's not coming, and she says I don't want to do it. Actually, what I will say to her is like, when well, you know the club port does this for you and. The race does this for you, and this is position. And I, you know, she'll be absolutely fine to do it now. She might not have been mm. as comfortable if she this was the situation. She was an eighteen-year-old or nineteen-year-old. Um, but we'll make sure she has the media training. So, because she won't. I remember that being the first time. It's like being afraid of what I'd say. Yeah. And then realize, and then actually starting the job and going, well, I say what I say. And I think the first interview I did with a news reporter, I think I was. I had three, had three pints, so I was like, "Fine, I'd just say whatever." And then the article was lovely, and I was like, "Okay, well, he really just does what say what." Um, but that can help having having a couple of pints. Uh, it's probably not, you know, it's it's also not the best advice career wise, but you know, it went worked out well and stuff, and you know, it wasn't mainstream newspaper, so it was fine. But um, you know, I think yeah, we talk about rowing. We look after them as human beings. Uh, in the, the 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 soft skills, I guess a little bit, and we try and create um, a safe place to fail, and we'll let's see what we can do with it. Um, and the 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 element of what we do that is always hard, and where the that that contradicts, and a lot of people just think, "Was so, well, you know, sixty people start, you just carry sixty people." Well. It's like, no, well, that's why we have colleges. If the college, if we kept all the athletes in the college and didn't get them back, we'd have uproar. You know, there's only two cities in the world where 50% of the student population will try the sport of rowing, and that's Oxford and Cambridge. Mm. Um, most universities in the world will be, yeah, might be 100 people in the whole university, same size, that 100 people, you know, we've got 10, 12, 15,000 people at this university wow. who will have tried the sport of rowing, and that'll be the same at Oxford. It's actually yeah. a bigger university, so possibly even more, but... You know, we've got 31 colleges. Every single one of them will have at least one boat, some of them up to five boats in just the women or just, and the men um, that will race in the in the two bumps races. Some of it will, will be horrible. Some of it will be okay. And, you know, and our part of that, their journey when they come here is you'll have those internationals, those people who will come in and want to do the boat race. And then we'll have... Um, 
uh, you know, the school leavers who go, actually, I would love to do the Burrows, and that sounds like a really cool way of ending my thing because I'm either don't have the passion or don't have the belief that the international pathway is what they want to do. Um, so we have people starting, we have people finishing, we have, and then we have these college kids who, you know, you can go back to who might have done a bit of swimming or done mm -hmm. different sports and it's like, oh, we can do this rowing thing. And they do one year at their college and they go, some of them come to us because like, yeah, the college is driving me nuts. They're not taking it seriously enough or something. It's like, well, that's because it's, you know, they're figuring out, you know, your coach is generally a second year and your first year. So and it's like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, if you're lucky enough to have a good coach, then think of it. But, you know, at least someone's helping you get on the water and having a go at it. Uh, and we're here to take that in. But it's also the fear of failure is we'll go from a squad of 60 to a squad of 20 or 30 with our spares, you know, and we have to do that over the next three months. And that's tough for them to worry about whether they made it. And then they have to pinch themselves. Did I really make it? Um, and then it's, then it's like, oh, but I just missed out on the blue boat and stuff. And so it's, it's a, that's probably the hardest job to create a positive environment because a negative environment can pull everyone down and we've got to like we've got to be managing those things to keep building everyone because you know when you've rowed and you've, you're sitting alongside someone and you're going but ah, okay well they're doing that and this is teaching me and i uh, think or i was like oh they're a couple of meters ahead of me right and i'm just going to see what i can change and not let them know i'm doing it and yeah. you know there's there's little rivalries and stuff but it's always got to be about it's always got to be about how we hold each other up. Yeah. Not. Yeah. And we. I think that's what we've well, we've hold on to really strong. There's mm -hmm. no. In my ten years, we've not had, or we've if if we've had some challenges, we've managed those challenges, not let them just get out of control. Yeah, well, that's kind of touched upon what I wanted to ask you next, which is obviously you've been here for a decade and you've seen the. Uh, the boat, the races go from through many different locations. The clubs merging. There's new different ways of training and everything. What would you say is like the most challenging part about having such a short season to to trim the pool of sixty athletes down to twenty, thirty something? And and like how could you how do you keep adapting to it as well? Uh, I think well, the toughest part is making them be able to walk away with being proud of how that what they contributed. That they f that they feel that they've added value, or that they have helped build the team that is hopefully holds itself to the to the values. You know, our value is um, you know our value is actually care. We don't use respect anymore, but we used to be respect. Um, the, the The club has its own values that it buys into, but as a as the um, as the women's team. Our, our value is care you know how do we care for each other to make ourselves stronger how do we care for each other to just our mental health how do we you know, just how do we care for each other um how do we care for the equipment care just covers everything but it does it in a um thing and it was actually it was actually watching just a random linkedin sort of scrolling through my linkedin and i saw a little article about it was a uh, one of the new zealand professional rugby teams and and uh, there was a guy going, so yeah, actually, we, we just care for each other. And in the, you know, the third, the, you know, getting into the last few minutes when you get knocked down, if you care for your teammates, you'll get straight back up. If you don't, you'll take a little bit longer. Yeah. And I, and I, but it was like, oh, I heard that. And then actually just went, we have used respect since I was a kid. And I just feel like it was, it's still a great word, but it has lost, lost its value. Um, or it's just so broad that it has no meaning. So uh, yeah, we use, we just we're talking a lot about how care and uh, it also chimed in with like it wasn't our word last year, but it was the word it really was the word that described last year and how um, we cared for each other and through the good and the bad times, um, you know. And it's very much a, you know it's our problem, but you know we went on training camp last year and we had we had so much rain on the first day. Oh my god, there was so much rain. Um, like there was rivers coming down the streets and wow. stuff into thing, and there were trees being washed in. And I think we lost between the men and us. I think we lost um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, something like eight, maybe even ten carbon fins. Ooh. 
And it's like, you know, aluminium fins went on. We lost a few of those as well. But, um, you know, we had a alumnus who happened to be coming in. He's like, can you bring some more fins with you? Uh-huh. Um, and, you know, that was that was unfortunate. It was just one of those years, and I'm sure they won't experience that again this year. But I'm not going back because I don't want to see that much rain in one day ever again. Um, yeah. yeah, I love that. I love care. I mean, we spoke before about um, you pull hard of your mates, you know, and we tried to make sure that there are sessions or times where they got a chance to um, spend more time with them, especially like in this in like university environment because they're in such different programs. They're quite often not even training together or in the boat together. Um, so that was a big one. Um, yeah, I like that. I mean, the other thing I like, just in terms of it, it goes with care and respect. You sort of twice said, "Well, we agree to dis- disagree," and I think that's almost a lot lost art form. I think people aren't willing anymore to sit in a room with someone that they disagree with, and I think like I agree. to be able to be like, "I, we're both professionals. We both have an opinion. There's more than one way to skin a cat. We'll agree to disagree on this one. We can still work together." And I think that's like that comes into it the care and respect thing as well. I just think there's so many people now just like. No, I don't agree with you. Yeah, I mean, what what the cause of that is? We can have our theories about whether it's you know social media and the echo mm. t- e- the echo chambers that we're all in, and yeah, um, and and sort of polarizing everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and I, it's not healthy. There was definitely, I mean, one of the team was a Trump voter, and um, they were like, but actually, you know, that's you know that's American politics, and yeah, it. Yeah. It sounds horrible to me, the whole American politics, but also I don't live it. Mm. So um, I can easily sit on a um, on a windowsill and have an opinion, but actually I don't live it. Um, we have Brexit. We've had a few things in the last few years. Even COVID mm. is such a, a polarizing uh, element to our society and people, people absolutely have the right to... It's not that people don't have the right, it's the people's... Um, it's that balancing of people's opinion versus listening to experts, mm. and I think, yeah, I think that's 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 dangerous when we're not willing to even listen to experts. And I've, I mean, I've watched on social media just what someone, I watched someone shut down an epidemiologist. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm done with, I'm done with yeah. Facebook. <laughs> like, I'm not having like yeah. that's just yeah. That's just so bad. Yeah, there's a doctor yeah. making a point, and then someone's like, "Yeah, but this YouTube video I watched." Yeah, and like, okay, <laughs> finish the like, conversation. You know, yeah. We've got soldiers doing this, and I'm like, man. Yeah. Um, Luckily, we we just talk about rowing. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's much simpler. Exactly, and you know, I'm, um, you know, I, I'm the first day. I went. This is my political views. If you contradict them, that's fine. But these are mine. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, and I, but I, I, I think listening to people with different political views, just because they they have different views in other areas, doesn't mean they have different views to you in every area. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And I think that's also the the ugly part. You know, I have some very close friends that I totally disagree with politically, but on the running front, yeah, we're all on the same page. Yeah, and that's um, and when we can't separate those two 100 percent agree that's 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 sad and you know there's an element of i hit 50 i don't care uh yeah, yeah. you know i i um people are allowed to be emotional and that's fine and yeah. it should be like it doesn't just because you're emotional doesn't mean you shouldn't be listened to or you have to sort of um I think I had a conversation. I'm getting sidetracked here. I talked into one of the coxswains this morning, and he's like, "Oh, you know, you treat, you know, of cox men and of cox women." And I said, so "What do you find the difference?" It's like, "Oh, well, you know, men you can just sort of be a bit more blunter with and stuff." And actually, I feel like I need to care. It's like, "Well, why do you feel you need to care?" It's they're expressing emotion. It doesn't mean they need more emotional support. And so, and there'll be a line where maybe they do, but pretty sure the bloke over here probably does too. Just doing a better job of hiding it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Um, very true so you know let's let's question I know when I deliver bad news I'm probably going to get tears but it doesn't mean I have to suddenly go there there it's going to be okay actually what I need to do is just give them the time and we'll continue to have the conversation and I respect that they're just showing emotions and that's Mm. fine Um, I guess underline treat people like human beings treat people like you want to treat themselves 
I'm not religious, but there are some pretty good values in there. That's a really interesting one. I think it's it's funny, isn't it? Quite often it's assumed in rowing, like, okay, so so this is how we treat the men. What, how would we treat the women differently? Well, this is this is how I would coach women, or this is how I would coach women differently. It might be interesting to actually look at what we're doing really well there and bring that back to men. We were talking about like being open, honest, emotions, those kind of things. Like, are we actually being way too blunt? You know, is there is there somewhere to access like how this system works? Mm. Women are a lot more supportive of each other, a lot more open with their problems. Like maybe just being like, well, hey, I could just as a cox tell them to like get your body bladed. You know, yeah. like there's different ways to do it. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting the way you kind of flip that on its Yeah, head. I mean, I think, I mean, again, I'm lucky. You know, some of these alumni did some pretty extraordinary things. Um, Kath Bishop being one of those. People, you know, we're going to hopefully speak to her soon as well. Yeah, um, her book's fabulous, um, and it really does make you sort of start to go. Actually, and you know, I'm not going to spoil. It. She, she, you know, she talks about her journey, and not all of it's positive, but she still managed to achieve, get to that level when no, I mean, when she won a silver, and then only one crew had ever won a silver medal before at the Olympics, right, you know, crew, yeah, which yeah. was the quad four years before, and she was running with one of them. Yeah. Um, you know, breaking new frontiers is like okay well now they just do it but there's those those learning how to win is yeah. not easy um the romanians do do it very well but anyway um you know her book you know like that you know the conversations during covid just being at a you know british rowing uh, or gb rowing offering the webinars that i was lucky enough to be able to sort of just listen into and just you know talk about women in sport and actually how little we know and going okay well I'm at one of the most prestigious universities in the world. If we don't know, I, I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to rewrite the because I don't have the knowledge. No one does. So let's just do what we do, and then just chip away at the softer at the moment at the softer side of things, and then hopefully through time, you know, a lot of people have the perception that we we have we have very close ties to the universities. Mm. But we don't work for the university. Mm. We are a club on its own. It's the same as Oxford, I believe. Um, you know, I don't have a university email address. I have a, I, mean, I have a Google email address, um, and you know we have exceptional relationships. But I can't, like a US university, I can't go to the admissions department and go, Can "You help this person out." Uh, I'm sure it's a little bit more complicated than that in the US too. But, oh yeah, <laughs> um, the. You know, you know, I'm not an employee of the university, um, and so I can't. And my my point here is that I can't go to the sort of a department and say, oh, you know, we, it'd be great if we could we create a, a research project. And so, so, one, I don't have any money to, to to help support that. So there's not really a, you know, most things are money driven, even in academia. Yeah. Um. So it's, but if I can be around and let let people know that I'm interested in hearing about these things and stuff and say, look, if we can get involved and still do, we, we need to be able to do what we do, but if we can share data or be do something like that, then hands up, we'll be there. Um, because they're all absolutely fascinated by, they want to know more. They want to, they want to, they want to be part of the journey. They're maybe a little bit nervous or something like that, or, or it seems too big, but if they can be part of it, That'd be cool. They don't have to actually lead on it. Um, I think that'd be really cool. I think I think even just talking about it is, is is a great thing because you never know who might be listening and maybe there's someone who actually just has the perfect resources and the, and the time just freed up for them and then they're actually able to take that project on or tell someone else about it and that's why it's uh, it's really enjoyable to like mix in and speak with lots of people from the from the rowing world because you can exchange ideas and you can think about you know solutions which will make it more enjoyable as a, as a sport but also more watchable and then maybe less uh, more distant from politics like you said like most people want to get into sport to avoid being into politics but there's also but, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are also you know you've got club politics which you need to abide by etc but i just think definitely the more recognition we can we can give to those issues in the sport the more likely they are going to be picked up by someone who who actually can spend some spend some time on it and you know you don't need to be a part of university in order to make any real change or even like propel that because i'm pretty sure 
if someone was doing an academic research project on this, they would they would also like come and come and speak to you and ask your opinion about this, having got so many years of experience in in, in those kind of areas. I think the underlying here is like the more I do this, the more I realize I don't know. Uh, that's the best way and, to think about it. Yeah. Yeah, but that's and also I, and I like to chip away at it. So it's like if I can chip away and learn bits and pieces and start to put the puzzle together in my own head, hopefully in the right direction, um, then that's then that's adding value. You know, so um, yeah. yeah, yeah, cool. I wanted to ask if you would mind sharing some secrets of your technical model that you implement <laughs> here at Cambridge, is because I always love watching the the boat race and just look at how neat the blade work is, how sharp it all goes, and obviously it's it's a really interesting environment that you you work with at the within within the boat race itself because you could have internationals, you could have college rowers, you could have people who've rowed nationally, etc. How do you like bring them all together and make them follow the exact same framework? Um, what sort of foundations are you are you looking upon? Um, Without giving away too much, obviously. No, no, no it's fine. It's fine. Um, uh, well, yeah. So I'll let you choose whether you decide to use this. So um, a few years ago, we had uh, so a very um, well, in my opinion, someone who is an incredible has been an incredible. Uh, contributed to women's rowing in this country is actually a guy called Mars, Mars Forbes Thomas. Um, he, you know, we talk about Paul Thompson doing the teams, but but without Miles and the, and a few others, but without Miles there actually chipping away at the ninety six and and bringing those athletes to London, then Tomo doesn't walk into a world to to take over from there. Um, and I wasn't part of that, so I'm sure I'm getting snapshots of how that fit. But anyway, so. Like Miles is an interesting character, and um, and sadly won't talk to me because I, because we parted ways. But that's 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 sad. But um, but he probably is. If I was to list the people who've taught me things, he's at close to the top of the list. And um, the so he. He, he 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 helped me question things about what we do and and you know he would come in and it was guest coach so he'd come in and give us some technical things and i was like okay that's the way we go and it's actually and then I, and I suddenly realized one day it's like actually he's coming in as a guest coach and he's seeing some issues or some things and he's giving us a solution to fix that in the very short time frame we have it's not necessarily how he would coach a crew from the beginning, yeah. but because of his depth of knowledge and his understanding of band, I think he's like, and so from an impact coach, he was phenomenal. Um, and, and yeah, I all honestly say, you know, some physiological stuff, some technical stuff that he probably helped um, shape the style we row, as did Valeri. You know, we don't use Valeri anymore because we had the peach system and I mean, that is that is what it is. But, um, you know, Valeri's book, um, you know, we talked just a slight segue. It's like if people are struggling to find knowledge, I think getting on the subscription list of Valeri's subscription, it's like, it's like 20 quid. You buy you pay 20 quid and forever you're getting his, um, his uh, newsletter. And, you know, some of them are like, well, that's deep. And some of them are like, okay, but there was one, I can't remember if it was Last World or 2021, but he was like, he did some, vi he, like, uh, some friends of his, he did some video analysis and he was looking at, you know, how on video now they, they can do, they can do all the points and stuff. So he was like, he did some analysis between men's and women's rowing. It's like, wow, someone's actually done something that's looking at the differences between the two. I'd never read anything till that point at about, you know, the successful rowers, the women were longer on the legs, the men were, uh, more legs and bodies you know there was a more of a hip swing for the men's crews and there's more it's like right okay because and then that ties in with the, some of the stuff that valeri talks about you know time on the foot stretcher versus power well and then it comes into a little bit about you know what i was like well do we have we have a, a bigger ratio between men and women between leg strength through to mm -hmm. body strength so let's take it that it's like if we focus on the legs, then we're looking for that volume piece. We're looking for time, time in the water, not necessarily as much, not as so much as about the power. Uh, power is important, but yeah, but it's not. But we're not. Um, 
men can probably roll a little bit shorter or can roll a little bit shorter and but because of the power they can really fill it out mm. but because of the recruitment of and the explosion again lots of variations but we we, you know, we need to talk about time in the water and having the skill to do that and then adding the power mm. um and that's what you see it's like you know we see us running long in the water um that's what we try and do and we certainly have the you know, that's 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 and that's a lot about it and then we talk about you know some of those exercises that miles told me and i still do you know quadruple feather <laughs> uh it's not we always great on, on the wrists but you know it's a yeah um we went on a training camp uh with the college we were coaching last year and uh, my old school rowing coach came for the day and uh like i'd forgotten that some of the things i was saying were his things yeah. Yeah. and uh yeah, I think we were just. I was talking about the concrete slot. He used to tell me, and I can imagine you're wearing in a little narrow path, and it's just uh, a I've slot. Heard, I've heard about three. It's like all the, the the going down the course with a whole bunch of stumps. You're just going from yeah, stumps yeah. to stumps <laughs> and pushing yourself as past. It's like, and uh, yeah. I yeah, uh, I just finished telling them, sort of looked at me, and he was like, "Still using that one, eh?" <laughs> <laughs> I forgot where they come from. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've I've been very lucky. Um, I mean, so Miles, Paul Reedy's, a, you know, um, I've had I've got three rows in my life where i rode with um basically an international one of those port is is uh trapmore one of those is reedy and another one's um oh i can't remember his name but he was uh australian cox pair in the late 90s and uh i can remember coming off the water going i now understand what my body's doing more than i did the session before <laughs> yeah yeah and i think you know we talk about the success here that is one of the successes the the you know the, I think there's actually some research come out recently that you've got or that sort of uh, gives a bit more percentage to it. It's like there's the verbal, there's the there's the visual, and there's the kinesthetic. You mm. get in a boat and row with someone like Grace Prendergast. Mm. Oh, some things are just going to make sense that didn't make sense before mm. because there's the woman who apparently can go even faster than what she's already done. Uh, they've done times at home in training that are faster than what they actually did. Um, she's retired, so that's a, her story. Um, and that's just a, a testament to the great program you're running here at Cambridge. If you can make athletes of that calibre still PV. Oh, no, no. I'm never going to claim. Grace was definitely on the radio. There. It's like Grace didn't PB here, but Imogen did. The fog that year that she rode with Grace, she went on to PB in the single, uh, the world championship, and then the following year in the double, which she was obviously fast before, but, you know. And that's what I'm saying. It's like it was that, especially that year, it was our journey. Mm -hmm. We all added our bits and experiences. Mine was the, you know, probably that year I was more of a manager than a coach. I did some coaching, but I was also making sure that all the pieces fit together and was flexible and to make those things work. You know, Imogen was his fifth year medic. She had places and placements in Luton. So we had to move things around and, and manage. It's like, yeah, okay, that we're going to work for her. And then how do I make it work for everyone else as well? Mm -hmm. So, you know, whereas normally we do this and this and that's how it works, but, you know, um, so the, but yeah, so you've got to change for what they need. So I probably am coaching more this year. We got some great athletes, but we're probably coaching more on some fun to do this because we've got one of the biggest teams we've had in several years tri uh, trialing. Yeah, we still have to get the same number by Christmas, but which is a testament to, the work we're doing, a testament to Autumn and Tell's assistant coach for the last two years and the work she was doing to, you know, make this feel um like a place you wanna you wanna come and train to and take the risk and stuff, because it is. Yeah. yeah. Um yeah. Keep chipping away, learning things and, and you know, next year if all the Olympians that we're talking to come, I'll be the manager again. You know, yeah. it's like you know, you just gotta and you, you, you impart and hopefully you can impart something to all of them, but, you know, yeah, they've also rode and they're hopefully, you know, you'd hope someone like Ruby and Grace and Imogen who've spent them in time in, in international is like, I've done an under 20, I did two under 23 campaigns. So that's cumulative of about six weeks at Cavisham. Um, I don't live there like some of these athletes, you know, essentially and, and the knowledge and the people they could talk to in that network is like, I would hope that they can bring things back and add value. Um, I have my guru team, but 
they've got bigger budgets than we do. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's a mark of a great athlete. It's a lot of people that can row really well in a nice sat boat. And then the next level is to kind of be able to make those changes and have that awareness and stuff. Um, I was pretty fascinated when Al Sinclair was like, oh, I don't think I'm, he was in the men's pair. And yeah, um, I don't, I don't think my strength was that I was a great rare. I think I just got the best out of everyone else around me. Yeah. And I was like, that is, that's it. That's what makes you great. Yeah. You know, to be able to, like you said, have that understanding, have that boat feel, impart that knowledge to those around you, yeah. make, get the best out of them yeah. whilst doing your best thing, the best yeah. you can do. Yeah. yeah, I think even as a coach, it extends to that too. Like maybe potentially even without saying this explicitly, but you've really highlighted like what it takes to create a winning culture and how to like say on top, you've got to be flexible, you've got to be willing to learn. You've got to sometimes listen to your athletes, be observant, sometimes manage, sometimes assume different role and uh, in general foster an environment which is both inclusive, but also like fosters um, and promotes growth. Because if everyone wants to improve around, then then that's going to cascade onto onto the rest of the team, and I think that's that's really beautiful, and <laughs> and and certainly what we have been seeing here at Cambridge. So I personally find uh, listening to to you talk about the program and the system and describing your journey like very very fascinating, and hopefully it can inspire some other people and potentially some athletes who will listen to this and then decide that they want to row for Cambridge. That'd be nice. Uh, uh, yeah. I'm tempted to drop Matilda's email address in there, so you'll email her. Um, we can put her at the bottom. <laughs> stick it on the bottom. <laughs> the, um, but yeah, you know, it's about... There is... The one beautiful thing about rowing is you don't get anywhere if you're not prepared to work. Yeah. Uh, and um, it doesn't always... You know, it's not always fair that work equals reward, mm. but there's, you know... There is. It's not always fair, but but you're not going to get even a, a sniff if you don't not prepared to do the work. And um, I think that's that's um, can definitely be twisted and stuff. But I think if we hold hold that to a, like in a, a wholesome way, um, then actually it's you know, and we care about each other and the stuff along the way, and we you know. Um, Rowing is a very, uh, it is lots of things, but it is a time expensive sport. Sure. And, um, and to, you know, to get to the, to where, you know, they have, they are all full-time students from PhD students to medics, to vets, to first year undergrads, um, classics, you know, um, just naming engineers, the architect um we usually only ever have one architect if we have any at all um <laughs> the the it's a yeah, it's this, this weird course where they have to do presentations at 10 o'clock at night and stuff it's like yeah you're still getting up at five um the uh, you know and we prioritize the academics and we plug the rowing in before enough schools so they're long days but um i don't think because of certain strikes, we don't have all the grades in for what was last year, but the last 10 years, we've always been above the academic average. So, um, you know, some of those old values like ask a busy person, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Just verbal skills. Yeah. You know, you have to learn the busier you are, the more you have to learn and manage yourself. And, you know, if you don't have anything to do, you can waste a lot of time. But also how you do one thing is how you do everything. And I think that's, that's just going to translate into both academia and, and the sport. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Do you mind if we ask you some quick fire round questions? Sure. I mean, you might get a long answer, but <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. The questions are going to be quick. The answers are, are up to you. Um, obviously, you've started your rowing journey in Australia, so you probably were exposed to a lot of different rowing venues and locations that you might have raced at, trained at, or visited. What are some of your favourites that you've been to or would like to visit again? And why? uh lake barrington in tasmania is truly beautiful it's the first time i uh you know went sculling and was able to back down and put my stern in a waterfall um wow. and just like i was there for six weeks once uh training camp it's i think um i've never been to lucerne would love to go there um but in some of the u.s city i think if anyone ever gets a chance to go to seattle and you're not 
Um, I'm sure actually because of the boats and everything else, the water's not always great, but actually mm -hmm. they've got a, like the campus and everything is just right there and they've got a really cool setup. Um, Texas has got a pretty good cool setup, a bit of a, a bit right. more of a commute, but it's like the boathouse and stuff and mm -hmm. warm weather all year round. Virginia, actually with the trees overhanging the lake and they can go different angles and stuff is is a truly beautiful boathouse. Morgan's um, gone to Virginia, our friend Morgan Bar Williams, new assistant coach. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, the but even getting to row like at uh from harvard and getting to row in the charles or the thing, i mean those you know it's if i was a young rower over again and i had the opportunity to go i would i would give it serious thought it's like um you know it is an incredible opportunity on the women's side it's, it's a billion it's a billion dollar industry mm -hmm. you know there are 88 schools i believe at last count there was 88 schools for division one schools in the states that offer scholarships you know wow. different standards sure but they're aspiring to be hopefully yeah. aspiring to be and you know, there's lots of reasons why that, that money's there football basketball usually on the men's side but um the that i can't see that that is only going to continue to grow because there are still the the differences between the standards of some of those programs is still quite large and I think as more more people see it as an option, but that's going to strengthen what happens at home. And I think we're uh, at that ebbs and flows, but I think that we're seeing that certainly here now. New Zealand's making it part of the decision. Australia's made it part of their system for a while. There's more and more Europeans and Eastern Europeans going over. Um, so it would be really interesting to see how that continues to evolve. And the part it plays in mm -hmm. in in people's journeys and stuff, because um, as I said earlier, it's like just look at the times in the semifinals. I don't think there's very few rare where the difference between some of the times in the semifinals is literally like bow balls, and that's just that's that's a level of competition that if you can get there, that we don't really yeah. well. We don't get here, but yeah. but also I think actually the changing the competition structure here, uh, I can't remember when they did it, but to, um, I mean, I hate time trials, they're boring as anything, but at the same time, then pooling the athletes into and creating finals where actually, it's yes, we'll race different pennants in the same race, mm -hmm. but we'll do it so that everyone's having a good race. No, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I raced plenty of times here and it's like, yeah, we've won. No, yeah. there's the next opposition. Whereas you look at the next race, and actually, it's like we would have had a race with them. Um, yeah, you know, just because it was a you know champ and senior one back in the day. It's definitely something America has, yeah, that we don't have. And I've lost to a few American crews at Henley and <clears throat> not had a close race all year, and then come up against yeah. these guys who've been having humdingers every week. Yeah. yeah, and and that's you know the you know hindsight being perfect, as I grew up in Adelaide, and um, all the best rowers in Adelaide left. I didn't, um, and that probably puts me somewhere on the fence in terms of whether I should have left or not. Um, but it did mean that I never had constant competition. Mm. And that's, that's, that plays a big part in how people develop and thrive. You know, pressure is important. Mm -hmm. um, pressure is very important and balanced and supported. Not, it yeah, can be destructive, obviously, but like, yeah, pressure to thrive not pressure to stress probably in getting a balance but you know our bodies also grow with stress so yeah it's, it's definitely something to take advantage of yeah. i wanted to ask you out of all the races you've done what's one race that you'd like to do when again uh, that you'd like to do again when you're 70 Ooh. uh so you mean if you as a coach or as an athlete as an athlete oh i'd do the four against brooks again oh Oh, it's a, a no-brainer, you know, with uh, Guy, Hugh, and Will, uh, you know, we had our, tw so it was 2003, so we did 20 years this year, and being able to do, and it's always on, like, so when I'm 70, God, that will be 40 years from the race. Yeah, that'd be great to do. Awesome. Um, yeah, not not sure Henry's back or cope with it, but um, <laughs> <laughs> although he'll be definitely fitter than all the other, everyone else. Um. Yeah. Nice. So that's awesome. Uh, I like to ask if you could travel back in time to meet the you when you first really caught the bug for rowing, when you first absolutely 
we're in. Doesn't every rower say, I wish I knew now what I, I wish I knew then what I know now? Yeah, so if you like, could I travel would be so much faster. Uh, uh, Jack Bowman specifically was like, I gave, I'm giving him some advice to be faster. Other people was more about different things. But yeah, if you could travel back time and give that kid one piece of advice. Uh, don't put everything into just the rowing. I spent five years probably just burying myself in rowing and not looking after the other aspects of me. Um, I should have gone to university earlier and found the balance in that earlier. And it would have been stressful and stuff, but and maybe, maybe, maybe it would have gone down there of quitting earlier, but maybe it would have actually helped me find um, a happier me because obviously, you know, you don't tend to quit if you're un when you're happy. Um, yeah, because it definitely, you know, it took me five, four years to then three years to start again to then find, and you know, I've got a photo of me after winning Henley and I just look content which is probably the only time i've ever looked at myself and gone yeah he's proud of what he's done and and i've actually you know but even winning is a very it is you, that balance between are you doing it for others or are you doing it for yourself yeah. the validation stuff yeah, that's, yeah. that's 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 another whole fucking conversation yeah, yeah yeah we'll have to have back on for that <laughs> yeah it's a tough line to tread yeah so i've got one last question okay. uh, we'll get into the story of why you called paddy and not patrick another time <laughs> but uh who are some of your rowing idols or people you've looked up to the most either during your career or during your coaching career oh uh i remember uh paul reedy um, dossing on his floor uh, in Melbourne and um, just think um, uh, my first well I had it's not my it wasn't my first coach but my first proper coach but the first coach that was one on one sort of thing so I was a scholar for in Australia so as I said there wasn't many other people to row with so uh, Brendan Tyrrell uh, called um, who had rowed with Paul Reedy actually that's I guess how I met them um Gosh, uh, he was, he was, he taught me so much more about feel and, uh, and, you know, tough love. It's like, well, if you're not going to turn up, you can fuck off. Um, the, and, and, and making the decision to turn up. And that was, and then, you know, you can't do everything and things like that. But, uh, ooh, who else? Um, so there were the early years. Um, I like Simon, you know, Simon Cox was great. Um, I've spent, I've been privileged to spend a little bit of time with Tim McLaren again from that era with Paul Reedy and stuff, but you know, that's where they knew each other. Um, gosh, uh, Robin Williams, I've ever been, Miles Forbes Thomas. Um, I just like listening to other people, how they talk. I'm not, I mean, I've done a pretty good job of talking to you guys, but at the same time, I actually just like listening to how other people yeah. explain things and and not going right. That's how I've got to do it. So what do I? What are the bits I like mm. that I think can make that I can explore that that, that strengthen me? Not necessarily just because if I try and do everything, I'm not going to be me. Anyway, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. And we get to sit down with different people every week and do this, and it's awesome. Yeah. And uh, we're doing a lot of that. And it's yeah. it's funny. A lot of people afterwards will be like, "Did that? I don't. Think it didn't." Was it all right? Was it all right? Oh, yeah. It was awesome. You just don't think it's awesome because it's all the stuff in your head yeah. that you already have. Yeah. But then if you get to do it enough times, you listen to it. I mean, I say that to the council. like, right, this is what's going on in my head. I'm going to explain it to you. <laughs> uh, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. You do a better job explaining mechanics than my professor does. I was like, probably in a small context, but okay, I'll take that. <laughs> I'm glad you understood because I've still not quite got it, but let's get on with it. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. And uh, it's like, it's been really, really interesting. Um, I love the general rule that's come out of it really is just keep learning, keep keep trying, keep, keep thinking. An environment um, that you can fail in, I think is undervalued. And um, it's been really interesting to sort of look behind the curtain a little bit. Yeah, I, I absolutely love the chat and yeah, definitely care for other people that's that's another big takeaway from 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 this chat because 
Well, that's, that, that seems to be the way to, to grow the fastest and, and most effectively. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with other people. And to work with other people, you got to care for them. So I absolutely love this. Quotes from this guy. He's got some good Oh, right. yeah, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm hoping I can really back in for another episode at some point with the, with the quotes. But other than that, I wish you all the best for Cambridge for this year. And and let's see and let's see how long the winning streak continues because you guys really do amazing work and definitely set the standard for other people to to look up to and potentially because you're so focused on making the bow go fast at hand you might not hear the chatter from other people where they would definitely describe it that way so it's been an absolute privilege and and thank you very much for seeing that with us oh thank you very much it was a oh, it was a pleasure it went very quickly it was it was just nice and easy and yeah easy to talk and scrape fun awesome. appreciate it so on that note. Easy there. Cue the music. <laughs>